Gary is a gifted visionary, spiritual teacher, a healer, a meditation master, who has dedicated his life to the path of enlightenment for many, many years. The purpose of his work is to assist individuals in creating spiritual, mental, and emotional coherence, which allows the innate perfection of the soul or your higher self to be revealed within form. This integration of the higher self within the physicality creates a human divine form. And this is exactly the next stage of evolution on earth. And we will talk about this today in great detail. My first leading question is, who is or what is source to you? Well, first of all, there is that which we call the void, which is everything before anything existed. And it asked the question, what am I? And then consciousness was developed. And so consciousness was then able to look back upon the void and began to illuminate it. And that illumination we call the Christ matrix or the Christ field because it is a field of uh, perfected consciousness that can illuminate within the void all that is. And then as it's illuminated through the Christ matrix, it literally comes forth into manifestation through the prismatic form of the Christ star, so to speak. So source then simply emanated itself out in a whole variety of ways, but it's all simply consciousness. Mm -hmm. The consciousness then has downloaded itself into myriad forms and uh, myriad possibilities, one of them being the human form that is so beautifully wired that it can literally be grounded within earth. But at the same time, that which is the soul or the higher self that even has developed physicality over the eons of time in order to learn how to finally get inside of it so that source could now be aware and alive within form for the first time. And so source is simply consciousness that is now becoming fully aware within form which then allows you to become source or God on earth, so to speak. I think people listening, their brains exploded a little bit because mine did just now, which is, yeah. <laughs> it's like, we can only conceptualize so much of like this awesomeness we call source because it's so multifaceted. Well, that leads me to the next question, which is what is EOMA? Mm -hmm. And how is it related to Christ energy? The Oma is talked about in the cosmology of India as Akasha. So it's not so much the etheric world. It's more a very, very fine, granular energy of super refined particles that simply emanated from out of the void. And then when... The Christ field illuminates within the void something, the mind of God, the mind of source, whatever you'd like to call it. It then creates a reflection off of that. It then moves through the faceted prism of the star tetrahedron, the Christ matrix, creates a holographic form of it. And then the OMA, these super fine particles in precipitate matter or materiality around that holographic form and three-dimensional physicality exists. Okay. So what is the difference between the God mind and the Christ mind, if any? The Christ mind is what we use to bring that which is God mind and spirit and matter into union. And so the Christ is the matrix that allows spirit and mind and form to be unified so that creation even exists. Got it. And so the Christ is the resource for bringing all of those three parts back together, the Trinity back into unity. Mm. I love how you mentioned in your book this sort of intuiting that you have around Christ being this crystalline matrix. It's this it's this like crystallized form. And then I think of our bones as being a crystalline matrix and it's the deepest right. core of us. So interesting. And um, when you even get down to the level of DNA, you see DNA is formed by the star tetrahedron. 
So if you take the star tetrahedron at its very finest level of creation and you then turn it and spin it upwards, it then creates the DNA matrix. Oh, get out. Wow. Yeah. Say that again. If you turn so if you take if you take the star tetrahedron. Okay. And as it's turning and spinning, as it spins up, it then creates the DNA matrix. I completely so, see that. Yeah. Okay. So here's the point, and here's the point over here. And the, the most interesting thing about it is then these are the protein structures of creation. Oh, my gosh. And as these protein structures, you see, then spin upward, it creates the DNA and the RNA that then becomes the form pattern for creation. So all creation exists within the structure of the star tetrahedron. From the very smine, smallest DNA to the size of a physical sun or a galaxy. Mm. It's all based upon the crystalline geometric form of the star tetrahedron. So we'll go off-roading for a brief second here. Mm -hmm. So off that, does it, is it like ridiculous for a human or does it even make sense or is it kind of a way of going against the beautiful creation that God or source has created in us as our DNA mm -hmm. is God eternal within the body. Why would we want to change the DNA or is that a good thing? We are awakening the DNA because they say that the DNA has probably 80% junk DNA. Right. But in fact, those are codes of information that as they are ignited, as we bring more light and harmony into the body, it then creates a new physical, almost light structure within form. And so we are now evolving beyond human. And the next wave of evolution is a human divine form. That's why the old paradigm is now falling away and crumbling because it was based on human, but the human paradigm is over. It was masculine manipulation. Okay. So could we, human 2.0 is really the next level of embodiment, which is the human divine form, rather than something else that has been propagated upon us. That's exactly right. I love that. Okay. And, and, what, it, and what it signifies is that that which we call the masculine, which is power, which is the old paradigm is manipulation and control and wanting and desiring. It has been honed down to the true aspect of masculine, which is simply focusing attention and light. The feminine principle of love and creativity and imagination is then through self-love ignited within. And so power, masculine, and love, feminine are then unified in this star tetrahedron matrix within and around us. Mm. That is the Christing. Got it. Which then begins to create the opening of new DNA sequences within the body so that we create the human divine form so that that which is the Christing can live in form on earth for the first time. And thus we create a whole another evolutionary cycle on the planet of grandeur and beauty and godlike qualities. Mm. Oh, exquisite. Very exciting. I'm loving this conversation. Well, again, I think I might be answering my question here. But off of what you just said, my question is, how does meditation refine consciousness so that the higher frequency is of this Christ energy or matrix get infused within it? And then the second part of that is really, or does it even really just depend on what is being meditated upon. Is it the key here, the masculine focused energy and the love, those two combined make an effectual meditation? Or am I putting a condition on it by even saying effective meditation? Just to meditate is to go beyond the mind and then it will take you where it needs to take you. Well, there are many, of course, types of meditation. Now, if meditation is about silencing the mind and bringing it into complete quietness, then you are developing the true aspect of masculine attention and action, which right. is simply focusing light. But then we must be able to use that light to be able to feel it, which is feminine, to be able to flow back down in and through the body and ferret out any subtle darkness in the body, which we call emotion. 
which is simply lack of love. So no matter how much we have mind developed, if we don't have love established, the feminine, it is still of nothing. And so when mind masculine is silent and we then allow it to open the heart and feel the emotion and love ourselves unconditionally because we awaken that childlike nature of creative joy and magic within in our unconditional love we then are using our masculine attention to now focus on imagination and feeling which is then the formulation of this new christ matrix which is then true meditation Mm -hmm. And then in this new meditation experience, because the mind is silent and is simply focusing light, and the star tetrahedron is now formulated around and through a field of consciousness within and through us, it opens this sacred doorway within the heart chakra, which India they call the jewel in the lotus, which is the portal back into the void from which all creation emerged out of. And then through the Christ matrix, We can simply focus light into the void and we can illuminate the choices of creation that already exist within source, within the mind of God. Mm -hmm. And as we illuminate them, it creates a reflection off of them. Then comes through the spinning star of the matrix of the Christ, spins out the holographic form, the Yoma precipitates around it, and voila, loaf and fish. Mm. Is love the fabric of the universe? Very much so. All creation is simply love, seeing what a source expressing itself, what it can be. And so it simply keeps giving more and more of itself, exuding itself as this infinite giver of love and light. And so everything is love. Literally everything. Doesn't even matter how dark it looks. It's still love beneath it because it's simply source seeking in how many different dimensions and realities can it experience itself because in the finality of it, nothing's happening. It's just a dream of consciousness. Are we dreaming? We are dreaming. But we're here to wake up in the dream and become conscious dreamers. Right now, humanity are unconscious dreamers. They dream themselves into form. From the higher being they are, the greater higher self, we dreamed materiality. We learn how to formulate it into physical form over eons of time. And now we're learning how to finally get inside that which we dreamed and then wake up inside of it so we become conscious dreamers of reality. So we're always essentially dreaming into form, but we are going to wake up eventually in the dream itself. Yes. And know that we are source, we are God, dreaming a, an even greater expansion of possibilities of reality. Mm-hmm. Can you describe the letting go process that you talk about from the spiritual perspective? It is love. It's going deeply into the cells and the tissues of the body and finding any of that emotion. All emotion begins from the time frame of conception to about seven years of age when we live simply in the feeling body. The mind doesn't develop until about age seven, but from conception to seven, whatever is within the family unit, within the programming of the world, with all that is going on around us, as well as our karma, it all comes back from that conception to seven years of age, and then we bury it in the body as emotion. Mm. And if we then go into that and begin to feel it and love it, as we feel the darkness, the loneliness, the sadness, the grief, we are simply bringing love. We slip beneath it and we find that innocent child that felt denied or unloved. And as we love it from the higher self we are, we are then the father, mother divine that originally created it. And it awakens back into its full glory of innocence. Mm -hmm. And that's all the creative joy of the feminine, you see, is with us once again. And if the masculine is now silent and attentive with simply light and attention, and the feminine of creative joy is alive, we then become the crystalline matrix of creation. I love that. Can you explain or perhaps extrapolate on 
what is the difference between being and knowing and why is that important? And I might just actually mm-hmm. read, um, Gary, from your book here, a short little excerpt on that, where Source simply but profoundly says to you, what you are going to do is a relationship building in the being. The being is actually more important than the knowing. The knowing is giving proof to the existence for being, whereas the being allows for all assembly to occur. Knowing gives the idea that it's possible. Being is the possibility coming into full potential. Can you? Isn't that beautiful, though? No, just, I mean, right. so exquisite. Yet it's a little, like, confusing too <laughs> you know it's like i get it yeah. and i don't get it at all in one way it's because so many spiritual people god bless them they still live in their knowing they are reading they are examining they're uh-huh. desiring they're looking which is fine that's the knowing and so they're looking for knowing and if they take the knowing and they begin to bring it into meditation and begin to feel it as liquid living light energy flowing into the body, they then become it. Uh-huh. And so the knowing is the becoming of the being. It's like when you know how to make a pie, if you don't bake the pie, it never happens. So you know it, but you don't have the pie to enjoy the texture and the joy of it. Uh-huh. Yeah, that explains it beautifully. Thank you for that. But that's, you see, the importance of that is one has to be able to ferret out of the body the emotion because emotion is the real key for spirituality and people is that they have very little ways to know how to get down deep into the cells and tissues. They create so much light within the aura from the diaphragm up because they know and they meditate and they're highly evolved individual souls Mm -hmm. But until you can fully ground it down into the cellular tissue and ferret out the emotion, it is still knowing and not being. Yeah, that's a really great point. We touched upon this when we first uh, met up and talked on the phone. And I remember uh, wanting to go into this a bit more because uh, I think we I mentioned in my work, I saw that as a very interesting pattern in a lot of spiritually um, uh, centered, uh, spiritually uh, inclined people, Mm -hmm. be it a minister, be it a healer, be it a meditator, um, a yogi, very open in the higher centers, but completely just (laughs) kerfuffled. Kerfuffled. That's a good word, kerfuffled. (laughs) <laughs> the perturbations were alive and well. And, um, and so, and I, and I just thought that was a really interesting pattern. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I wonder, gosh, it's like they have one foot in sort of, it feels that way. Uh, yeah. One foot in, one foot out. It's almost like, yeah, I don't have time to deal with this reality. I'm dealing, I, my, my eyes are on God, which is beautiful. Yes. But at the same time, there's all this stuff that's kind of not been cleaned up and left behind. Right. And it comes back, you see, to the old religious programming that we evolved from, which was go find God. Uh, the higher self is up above. It's all you're going to then find it and then you'll be able to go to heaven. You will ascend into it which is, again, the old masculine programming and part of the religious structure, that's fine. But with a new paradigm that awakened in really December 21st of 2021, when we begin to really move into Aquarius and the feminine, we now must embody it. And so ascension isn't leaving. Ascension is bringing the fullness of the higher self, the Christed matrix, in and through to evolve a human divine being that can architect the new heaven on earth here, you see. Mm. So we fall ever more deeply in love with Mother Earth and all the majesty of creation because we know now that we can create it from the great creator beings we're becoming. With this new Aquarian energy, mm-hmm. is this a time of the feminine Christedness, or is that just a sort of verbiage spiritual people are using to try to just 
create something that's not. Well, first of all, you see, the Christ is not a person. Yeah. The Christ, the Christ is a verb, and the verb is making, creating. That's what the Christ is: is the creating and the making of life. The new, the feminine that is coming online is the true feminine of creative love and joy, because that's the true archetype of feminine that was pushed down and suppressed for eons of time as the masculine moved into dominance. But now the masculine paradigm is crumbling. We see that very clearly out there. And spiritual people are realizing it's no longer about mind and knowing. And some of them are now moving into hard feminine feeling so that she moves into equal ascension with the masculine. The two come into the mystical marriage, which is the star tetrahedron, which creates the Christ matrix. And so that is then the making and the doing of a creatorship. Is that what you just described, not only the Christed energy, is that the Ark of the Covenant? Is that what the Ark of the Covenant is? My feeling the Ark of the Covenant is the Christ star, the Christ matrix, the star tetrahedron, because it opens the doorway back into the infinite potential within the void. And so when it opens and you have fully formulated the star tetrahedron around you, the Christ matrix, Power is fully aligned. Love is fully awakened. You can be trusted with all the powers of heaven and earth because when you open that doorway, infinite possibilities are now before you. And so you have to be so steeped in love and in authenticity because all those powers are extreme. Yeah. With a thought and a feeling, you could destroy something. You could simply dissolve it. You know how the dream is created. You know how the dream is being dreamed within dimensional reality. And with the thought and the feeling, you see, you can simply undream it. Mm. That's possible. But like the being Jesus who mastered the Christ condition, he was enabled to bring life anew, you see. Yeah. Yeah. Whew. Better take this and <laughs> little chocolate chunks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, we will reconvene in 15 minutes. Um, so, so, yeah, my next question is... I love your questions. Thank you. I have, a, I have a lot of them. I'm, I'm, hence, the spiritual geek out is really the spiritual nerd out to the nth degree. Um, you, you talk about the unscrolling and the unraveling mm -hmm. of the original systems of the body. Mm-hmm. What are they? What are the original systems of the body? In the original part of our DNA is the origination of all time. So all time began from the very first amoeba. And from that amoeba, all the DNA that creates the sequencing of the human form that you and I are, that DNA has over eons unscrolled or been developed within the DNA of our bodies. And so when we bring the fullness of the Christ liquid golden light back down inside and we awaken all of those structures of junk DNA, we then are unraveling all the sequences from the very beginning of that amoeba clear up to the evolutionary being we are and we know them and we experience them as one simultaneous event. <sighs> Good night. Okay. <laughs> Why do they say, this is kind of a silly question, but. Who is they? <laughs> that is another great question. Uh, who is they? The, who is they? The collection of those in the masculine, perhaps the, the, the power players. Right. That deem uh, to control a story or a narrative like. 80% of your DNA is junk DNA. Right. Is that told to us, projected to us, or just what is known to those scientists, those people, whoever say that, because they just don't have the consciousness or the technology yet to really know what that is, that what you're describing? They don't have the consciousness nor the technology, so they look at it and their technology says it doesn't do anything 
but their consciousness doesn't know the deeper meaning of what it really is all about because we have so de-evolved as human beings. Mm. So 12,400 years ago, the time we call Atlantis was the height of the golden age. And if you understand the procession of the equinoxes, the 26,400 year turn of our solar system through the galaxy, we then go in a wave cycle up and a wave cycle down. 12,400 years ago, we were at the very apex of that, which was a golden civilization. We ascended into it. And so consciousness was very high. But then Atlantis and the younger driest event, which is the destruction of much of the planet at that time, we then began to move on the descending arc of consciousness. And we reached that at the end of the Piscean Age, which was December 21st of 2021. We now move into the Aquarian Age, and we're now moving back up, you see, into another golden age. And it's not simply a wave like this. It's a wave that is always spiraling upwards. And so consciousness is ascending as it goes through these cycles of up and down. And so 12,400 years ago, the consciousness of humanity was very high. There were gods and goddesses walking on earth. But then we lost that. And the pyramids, you see, are simply built to remember some of that great civilization. Remember, it says in the book that the pyramids were built to hold the consciousness of destructuring what humanity was, the memory of the destructuring. Yeah, and I wanted to get into that. I um, Maybe we'll circle back to that because I do want you to talk about the Sphinx and the nature of that and the consciousness of that and those people, too, before the Anunnaki mm-hmm. that are responsible for that. But... Off of what you're talking about here, I wanted to just ask you, so in this ascending and descending cycle, are we ascending or cycling down by choice into chaos? Well, somewhat. It's just the cycles of time, you know, um, time cycles. It's just a creative, uh, you know, the creation of life moving through the cosmos. You know, everything is turning and moving uh, from out of the very core of the Milky Way, which is a uh, entry back into the void. Okay. So from out of the void within the very center of the galaxy, it is emitting the consciousness that created the galaxy. Okay. Within our sun, there is also, as you see, another portal back into the void. And from out of it is emanating the consciousnesses in our solar system, our sun. And so everything is simply consciousness emanating from inside out, and it moves in cycles of time. And so as we in the solar system move through the pattern of the equinoxes in the galaxy, the galaxy is really the part of us that is the higher, higher being that is evolving us as we simply move upwards with it. Got it. Well, you mentioned in your book, you say, and I would love for you to just talk about this a bit more so I can understand it and... Hopefully it will serve others listening. Source says the whole illuminating origin of the nature of all being is what is being storied. Mm -hmm. And it's what is being stored. As it gets stored, it is protected. Because right now in man, man is being eaten alive, losing its power. And as it loses its power, man just cycles down into chaos. Right. Which is why I was asking, are we doing that intentionally, unintentionally, by choice? What do you mean by, can you explain that being sure. stored versus being stored? Sure. Of course, the old masculine paradigm is over, and so it is destructuring. And so that is the cycling down into chaos. And there is the new man-woman that is being architected. It is being storied. And so source dialogues is that story. It is how to create a Christed revelation inside of oneself. All the information is within the book to fully awaken back into full revelation of the greater being you are within form to become a creator being. And as it is then being stored within the cells and tissues of my body, 
it is then the possibility of it then being vibrationally emanating from me as well as others like that who then begin to have it within their physical form that is now the if you will matrix for the becoming of the new mm. okay so Got it's it. being stored within physical form that's why it has to be in being ah not okay. knowing see yep being because once it's see within being, it's actually within the cellular memory of your water. And so your water then goes into earth and it automatically begins to crystal and restructure earth's water as well. Oh my gosh. You're 80% water. Right. But your water is vibrating to where your consciousness is. If it's vibrating to the Christ matrix, which is then the higher being you are, that is then creating the new wave of water within mother earth as well. Oof, that's deep. Okay. Well, let's talk about alchemy. How does spirit move through the conductivity of gold? And why and how are diamonds the next wave of evolution that Source talks about on this planet? Gold is a substance that has no resistance within it. And so it moves energy with no resistance. It's the only substance that does that. It's the only substance. Only substance where there's actually no resistance at all. So electrons and photons can move through gold with complete non-resistance. Yeah. Wow. And, and gold can, can combine with any element on Earth, but then you can simply extract it from any element on Earth. Okay. And so it comes back to its original source, what it is, just gold. Shoo. And because that was baining in and through Mother Earth, the creation light of Mother Earth, which is within her, as it is emanating out, it moves through the conductivity of gold veining through Earth and brings organic material substance into form on the surface of the Earth. And so the consciousness within the very core of Mother Earth is now manifest through the gold as actual physical organic structure on the planet. This is Mother Earth revealing her consciousness. Wow. Okay. So now the diamond is a prismatic form. And so the prismatic form is the star tetrahedron. You take the gold and you refine it into a matrix of purity within you that is consciousness now refining it, loving it, refining it. It is now honed and refined into the star matrix, which is a prismatic form. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. And so Christed beings will be, if you will, diamond matrix individuals walking on the planet. I just think of the words of BKSA Ingar when he says we are a diamond. Well, let's circle back if we can to ancient Egypt, because many of us, I think many of us, at least listening perhaps to this podcast have been perhaps familiarized with the idea that ancient beings or ancient technology that isn't on the planet perhaps right now is or was responsible for their construction of the Sphinx, the pyramids, floating stones, mm -hmm. things like that. And Source, in your book, talks about the Sphinx as being a dimensional or, correct me if I'm wrong. Dimensional train. Yeah, or interdimensional train? Yes, interdimensional train. Okay. And can you tell me more about this? And also, these beings that came before the Anunnaki, mm -hmm. that Source says was responsible for these structures, or at least the Sphinx, who were they? Was there is there a name for them? You know, probably some of them were from the Pleiades. Uh, some of them were probably from the star system Cirrus. Okay. Now, the um, American Indians in their cosmology trace their cosmology back to the star system, the Pleiades, the okay. Seven Sisters. The Aborigines, they trace their cosmology back to the star system, Cirrus. Hmm. Okay. Now, there's another gentleman called Makua, a Hawaiian elder, and he wrote a book called Bowl of Light. And he said that 500,000 years ago, he and his people came from the star system, Cirrus, on canoes of light to the earth. And the only consciousness that was here to receive them 
was the cetaceans. And so that consciousness went into the whales and the dolphins to begin to create energy of consciousness on the planet. Now, the aboriginals believe that when they die, they go back to their true bodies, which are dolphin bodies. Wow. And so there are many different star systems that came to begin to seed information into the planet. There are Syrians, there are Pleiadians, there are Turians. So many different individuals came. And this is the individual that taught the Atlanteans how to literally hone and refine themselves to become gods and goddesses, so to speak. Highly, highly evolved individuals. But then they began to misuse their power as they tried then to overrun the earth, which was within the destruction of Atlantis. But some of them were able to leave Atlantis before it was destroyed, and they went to Egypt. And in that sacred place there, they then built all the pyramids and all the structures. The Sphinx was already there. Because it was the dimensional train that allowed these other individuals to come through that portal. So that's what the Sphinx is. So the Sphinx is, is a portal, which many of yes. us are familiar with. Where else is there a portal? I think of the Nepali coast as a portal. Which the, one? The no. Nepali coast on Kauai, which very is... Very much so, yes. The yeah. whole Hawaiian islands yeah. are a portal. Yeah. yeah. It's the, Lemur, it's the Lemurian portal. It's where the Lemurians, about uh, 150,000 uh, BC, originally came into the dimensional train of the Pacific. So that's the, the Lemurians, the Mu civilization. Yeah. And they then created um, Easter Island, uh, all the structures in Polynesia. They then migrated to uh, the area of the Andes and up in uh, Bolivia. They created some of those sacred structures in Bolivia. Is the Pacific Coast, like around California, also considered Lemurian territory, or no? Okay. They, some of them migrated to, um, the, you know, the Andes and to the North America when uh, when Mu was then beginning to descend. But uh, you know, it was after that. Hmm. Where else are there portals? Would you say the Himalayas is a portal? Definitely one in the Himalayas. Uh, there's one in Machu Picchu. Okay. Uh, there's one in Palenque in um, South America. And so when you go to uh, Palenque, there is a, a beautiful structure. There are beautiful, a bunch of old temples in Palenque. And there is a, um, a stone sarcophagus. And the, the fellow who is in it, his name Pakal, P-A-C-A-L. And he is over seven feet tall. And all of the Indians are maybe five feet at most. So here's this great being supposedly came from the Pleiades that was holding the energy for that whole Andean region. So it's a Pleiadian portal. Wow. Shoof. Okay. Well, let's shift years, I guess. I mean, I could talk about that for a whole other hour. <laughs> <laughs> Several hours. We could be here for days and I would yeah, like it. <laughs> I'd be fine with that, actually. <laughs> Bring us some food and water. We'll be here. My family would like that, but they'll understand. <laughs> there Diane goes again. <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, well, let's uh, kind of circle back to your um, wonderful book, The Source Dialogues. And uh, around mind, around the area, the subject of the nature of manifestation. Mm -hmm. How is the mind of matter replicating what we see? Can you explain how universal structure aligns to imagination? Or simply put, what is the nature of manifesting? There is conscious and dynamic manifestation, which is through the star tetrahedron and the Christ matrix. You're able to actually open the portal back into the void and illuminate the choices of your creation which then creates a reflection off of it that then the Yoma precipitates into form. So that is conscious creation. Now, every moment around you, everything is simply in a wave form. And we know from quantum physics, when the wave form of the photon, you then bring consciousness and attention to it, it collapses into a particle. And so everything that you're seeing, when you turn away from it, it's a wave form. 
that's hard to believe and it's hard to understand, but that's what's happening. And so in the same way, whatever you are emanating as your vibration, power or powerlessness or love or peace or sadness or grace, that emanation is going out and the mind of matter is already beginning to replicate that and you're now meeting it. And so there's no victims on the planet. There are simply individuals vibrating out who and what they are at a quantum level. And then materiality then is attracted to a, we call it the law of attraction, but it's actually the mind of matter beginning to replicate who and what they are. Mm-hmm. And then when massive individuals come together, then, then they create an even more mass emanation of consciousness, which then creates a group experience. Mm. Now, when you become more conscious, you see, and you know that I am now emanating and feeling from me prosperity and love and joy and peace and harmony, you could only attract to you prosperity, peace, love, joy, and harmony. But if you have unconsciously at the base of the spine fear and worry, you're going to attract things that are fearful, a little bit worrisome. And you think, well, that's happening to me. Right. But in fact, you're drawing it to you. The matter, the mind of matter is replicating it. But when you become more conscious of the being you are, you know what you're creating. There's never a worry. There's never a concern. You know that life is simply in goodness and grace being met every moment. That's really beautifully put. I feel like you just answered about three or four of my next questions around what you just shared. Because I feel like you're describing, to me, the law of radiation, which is the law of attraction, how you read it. Okay. And you see, we're emanating, you see, from seven energy centers. Right. And so the first chakra, base of the spine, fear and worry. Second chakra, emotions, feelings, sexuality. Third chakra, either power or powerlessness. Mm -hmm. Fourth chakra, either love or lack of love. Mm-hmm. So each of us is now emanating at those, it's like you're creating seven movies simultaneously from you. And then the mind of matter replicates it around you. So do we essentially become what we think? 100%. But as well, what you, we unconsciously think. Okay. Where I'm kind of just want to, I want to iron this out. Mm-hmm. And I think you answered it with, well, if we're, if we're thinking, if we're, manit- if we're meditating on prosperity or be in our beingness of prosperity consciousness, then we will get that reflected back to us. However, if there is unconscious um, stuff that's being stored that is lack consciousness or mm-hmm. fear or worry, then we're going to get some of that in the mix. However, does, doesn't karma or providence come into play? In other words, um, do we, if we are, if it's not our karma to experience something, then creation itself will not bring it into fruition? So karma is simply lack of love. Karma is lack of Of love. love. I had never like that. Okay. Whatever you do not love with inside of yourself is your karma. Oh. And that was created by, in many, many past lives, doing things in error or in egregious things to others. And so you created a sense of worry and fear and anger and frustration. And all of that karma, this is very important, all that karma is brought back into this lifetime and through conception to seven years of age, you are given all of your karma once again. Oof. Okay. And if you learn to love yourself, all of your karma. Okay. okay. Whatever you have not loved in the past is there. Your father is abusive. You are abusive. Your mother is unloving and worrisome. You are unloving and worrisome. The child feels that. And it may not be in the degree that, you know, someone was in the past. Like someone could have been a a very nasty commander and really harming a lot of people. And your father may have been somewhat abusive, so he's not a nasty commander. But the feeling of the child is the same. I'm powerless. Yeah. And so if you learn, you see, to bring the higher self you are that gathered all of that karma together And then created the mother, the father, and all the physical form and structure within this dimension. And you were born into it. 
from zero to seven is there. Mm -hmm. You're able then to silence the mind, bring it back into focus, learn to love yourself and bring light and love back down in and through the body. You can feel the emotion, what you don't love, as you go through it and love yourself, that child, and awaken the innocence of it once again. You have loved yourself. Karma is dispelled. And as you do that, then you can become a creator being that can simply create whatever you like because it's your joy. There's no longer karma that overshadows you. You're free to be a creator being. Hmm. That's very um, encouraging, I hope, for people listening. Yeah, very exciting, yes. Very exciting, yeah. yeah. It's all right here, right now. Yeah, no more waiting. Go get it. And you see, and everything that's happening to you is simply enlivening your karma. And so if you're seeing something that's angry today, you think it's today, but it's a signpost that is pointing back to your childhood. Is it all pointing back to zero to seven? Zero to seven. All of it. Shoo. God. And then you think of people that had a lot or what you deem to be a lot of trauma between zero and seven. Yeah. And you go, gosh. Yeah, I like to say that, you know, I can compare pain and suffering with anyone on the planet and tire win from my childhood. Hmm. It was it was that difficult. I was abandoned. I was put in a home. Wow. But now I look at that and I am so in love with my childhood. So in love. Because every part of it was simply giving me information about how to love myself. Mm-hmm. God, I love that so much. That is exquisite. It's so exquisite to hear that. And especially for people listening with their own individualized suffering to know that you can return back to the loving wholeheartedly, that you can transmute anything. 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 Yeah. Literally anything. But you have to have a desire. And because you see, humanity keeps us so programmed, as you know, in limitation and belief systems, there has to be a part of you that has such a burning desire. You're willing to give up your whole life for it. Yes. Yes, I really hear that. I can relate to that. And it becomes critical, you see, on the planet now, because we're destructuring so quickly and so rapidly that more and more chaos is probably at hand. And to really now turn yourself to your spiritual awakening, if it's not going to happen now, then you're in for chaos. Because this planet is ascending and so much is moving so quickly and now's the time and period, end of sentence. Yes. Mother Earth has already awakened her new body. It's already emanating from inside out of her and it's another body of perfection. It's just like when the uh, dinosaurs 65,000 years ago, when the asteroid hit, of course, it wasn't by mistake. It was part of the plan, part of the uh, awakening, the destruction of that paradigm so that Mother Earth could then begin to emanate out a whole new life wave, which was the mammals. Mm. And so then began the whole evolution of a whole new experience for Mother Earth. She is evolving and developing her consciousness because she is an evolving being. And she is already now emanating her new body, and she is inviting those who want to live in harmony and peace and goodness and grace to move into relationship with her as they become human divine beings. So those that don't, they just won't be able to be sustained on this planet. Exactly so. Yeah, I hear that. Who or what is the energy being or aspect that is looking over planet Earth? Well, it's Gaia. It's Gaia's Mother Earth. It's a consciousness, a highly evolved consciousness. It is also Mother Earth is part of the consciousness of this great being we call the solar logos, the sun. So the sun has as its seven chakras of manifestation, the planets. But each of them is also developing their consciousness. Okay. And so the sun in 
revelation and light giving of energy to all the planets, which it does. It also calls forth from out of the planet what is their desire and evolution. And so it was a full co-creative experience with the whole solar system. Can you explain um, this idea that you mention in your book where you comment on the ultimate purpose of the evolution of the being of this planet is to stave off the non-trio and keep yes. protecting life. Can you explain that? The no-trio is spirit, mind, and form. That's the trinity. How is it a no-trio? Because if those are gone, then there's no life. Oh. To stave off a no-trio is to hold those things fast. Spirit, oh. mind, form. I see. Okay. And so on a planet like Mars, the no trio you see was gone. Spirit, mind, and body was destroyed. So what happened on Mars? Well, I don't know for sure, but I'm, I'm thinking there was probably an evolutionary uh, people long, long, long ago before we have even any possible memory of it that probably destroyed the ecosystem. Mm. Okay. I mean, that's just a supposition. Right. It's a very strange universe out there. <laughs> Part two with Gary Springfield. It's a <laughs> strange universe. <laughs> it's a strange universe. It's an exciting universe. But there's no victims in the universe. Mm. No victims. You simply create from the emanation of your energy what you're going to experience. And so nothing can hurt you or harm you. It can reflect back to you something that is fearful within you. And as you love yourself and let go of it and bring light, the darkness cannot come unto you. So there's nothing to be fearful of or worry about. How do you explain that to people that have been, I'm quick to say victims of, because of the conditioning that we've been given, victims of war, victims of, you know, uh, poverty, what do you say to people that say, well, I, I, I grew up in the Holocaust. My, my family was wiped out. I didn't choose that. They don't have a deep enough understanding of consciousness that has been evolving from time immemorial. And if you look at the history of the planet, it's been a history of nothing but war and conquest and suffering and overriding of civilizations. And so everyone has played a part in that. And so in one set of time, if you were part of a civilization, say it's the Romans, that destroyed the Jewish population, you could come back and be in some place like Ukraine. Ah. And so you're simply experiencing, you see, what you have done before. Your karma comes back. It always comes back. Right. What is the battle that we are preparing for right now on planet Earth? It's the battle for survival. It's the battle of the mind to be able to use the mind to so love and honor the creative feminine that you're able then to begin to create life from inside out. Human beings are only creating with what exists on the planet. It's like the clay out here. They use it. They mold it. They make from it. They do from it. But then they've destroyed most of the clay. Yeah. And so now the new human divine being must be able to manifest life from inside out. Okay, that's clear. Well, there are so many warnings, if we look at it spiritually or otherwise. Why do you think it falls on deaf ears, or at least for the masses, or the majority of people? They're so lost in their own ignorance of wanting, desiring, programming, um, the manipulation, the control of uh, society, of the news, of uh, their small screens. And it's all part of hoping by being more encased in that limitation that it might rattle their cage and see, you know, individuals individually begin to wake up. But very few are waking up at this time because there is, it takes such a clear knowing and a feeling of the identity of the being you are to move into this new future that's becoming. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole new evolution of beings that are being born, you know, out there that are able now to probably move more easily into this. But you and I, we are opening the doorway. We are the placeholders. We are the seeds. 
and many individuals like you and I who are the spiritual beings that are illuminated, we're the seeds that are planting the information. Okay. That makes complete sense and very purposeful. Always purposeful, but it doesn't necessarily look good. But at the same time, you see, if you simply observe what is going on without any judgment or any criticism and realize it's simply spirit revealing itself, just like when you have a beautiful rose, you enjoy the beauty of the rose. But when the rose finally dies and falls away, you wait for the next budding of the rose. Right. That's what's happening on the planet. And so you don't mourn the rose as it simply falls away. You might have a remembrance of the beauty of it, but you prepare yourself for the new becoming. Can our consciousness create a new, as you say in your book, terraforma for the planet and bring it back or upgrade it to a new version of itself so it's sustainable? Is that possible? Mother Earth is going to do that with or without us. Okay. And so if we choose to step into our true relationship of the human divine being we are, we can then become co-creative knowing of how to do that in an even more grand and auspicious way. So we become co-creators with this divine being, Gaia. Can you imagine humanity, you see, just like the Internet? They're totally awakened. They're uh, in their Christ matrix. They're then unified like the Internet of oneness. That is now around the globe. We can actually feel the life force of Mother Earth. We know her next trajectory of evolution and creation. It's coming in and through us. We are now the mind of Gaia that is able then to form that into creation. How outrageous. Mm. What a planet. And I just think, gosh, weren't we doing this before? Weren't the Lemurians doing this? Weren't we just making things into form as a collective harmony? Yes. Yes. Yes, but then but then like the Atlanteans, you see, we then got in the place of believing that we were the ones that were powerful. We lost our humbleness, our sense of you know, self was lost, and we began to try and overrun and control the planet. And so then 12,900 years ago, the Younger Dryas event, probably a great comet, as well as the shifting of the Earth's axis, most of life on the planet was destroyed. Mm. And so simply Mother Earth said, no, this is not it. Time for a new wave of evolution. But it was the destructuring of that we're now at the bottom of that is now going to be the restructuring of an even more grander rose, so to speak. So it is... It is an upgrade, Mm -hmm. for lack of a better word. Yes, very much an upgrade. Okay, that is, again, very exciting. When I began to, you know, in my college years, began to study, you know, the individual, you know, Christ, Buddha, Krishna, you know, all the great masters, I thought to myself, wow, that's an amazing accomplishment. Is it really possible? But now over these last, you know, four to five years, of dedicating my life to a whole nother level of the integration and the revelation of this within me, I know it's actually happening. I'm experiencing it. What the book said, I'm experiencing in my body and in my life. You're being it rather than... I'm being it, yes. Mm. And it's been an outrageous challenge. The body has gone through some amazing restructuring, some reformatting. Consciousness has changed dramatically. The mind is now a perfectly silent instrument. Focusing light upon the heart and feminine feeling. The star tetrahedron is every day becoming more clear and dynamic and aligned around me. You can feel the doorway open. And from as you're breathing out, you see you're actually breathing spirit into this dimension. Mm. It touches the facets of the spinning star. And then it emanates this liquid golden light from you. Mm. And you feel it. Yeah. That's a beautiful image. <laughs> Just, I think of one of my teachers who says, God or the God of our understanding, this energy, this divine energy is closer to you than even your breathing in and breathing out. It is your breathing. Mm. And you see, my friend, that's one of the things I really enjoyed when I uh, first talked to you, because you emanate this same light from you. It's just that I have done it in a much more conscious, dynamic way. Right. Because I've given my life, do you see, to it in another way. You're doing your purpose, which is to emanate light, and you do it quite beautifully. A lot of golden light around you, a lot of emanation of pure light, 
I'm just now magnifying it in a whole nother way. Yeah. Be- beautiful. Beautifully said. Thank you, by the way. Well, I have just a couple more questions and then I'll let you go. Oh, don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's fine. fine with me. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like you. I love chatting about this. I could just chat for oh, hours upon great. hours. Oh, this is such a, just a, such a refreshing, juicy talk. And, um, I mean, I, I should have written down more questions, but, uh, here's what I got today. Okay. Talk to me about the Taurus field. And I'll just read from your book for a reference for those again, listening because I think it's worthy of note. Sandra, who you're doing these sessions with, this woman, you can comment on that if you'd like for a greater context in your book. But you say, Sandra had a session with another client, and it was revealed that a sphere, Taurus, which is composed of source mind energy, creates a point of irritation in order to create knowledge and awareness. The analogy was an oyster with a grain of sand creating a luminescent pearl of beauty from irritation. And you go into this questioning of the Taurus field and what exactly that irritation is that is calling you, Garrett, into higher expression. Can you explain that? The Taurus field, of course, this is the image of the Taurus field. Yeah, which I would call, as a biofield healer, the biofield which is a toroidal field and the biofield you see is about maybe two three feet around us Mm -hmm. the torus field of mind is 12 feet above 12 feet below and 35 to 40 feet around us okay so that's a distinction right yes so it is a field of simply pure mind pure consciousness in perfection And it is the perfection of the great mind, the being you are, that is seeking to reveal itself within form. Okay. So eons ago, it created the soul. The soul was then able to beginning to architect form to get inside, to gather information. The information from the soul is then posited in the higher mind so it knows who and what it is. And as we now know that I am the Taurus field, the divine mind, I've now created the star tetrahedron by the mind I am. I'm perfectly balanced in mind action and love. I open the doorway. Mind pierced the open doorway. It illuminates within the void, the unconscious, the mind of God, creates the reflection out. And so the mind of God you are is now creating through the Christ you are life around you. I think I just got a transmission. Good. (laughs) So the Taurus field down through the very center of it, you see, is the spinal column. Okay, right. And as it comes, it really emanates from the heart. You see, just like from the very center of the galaxy, there's a dark black hole, the very center of the galaxy. And from out of it emanated the whole galaxy of the Milky Way. In the same way, at the center of you in the heart chakra, this is the void. This is the opening portal. From out of it, the Taurus field of mind was created. It then began to develop the soul. The soul then began to develop form. You don't know that you're the mind. You still think you're the form. But you begin to reveal consciousness. You know, I am the form, but I'm also the soul. And now I realize that I am the mind that's been creating the whole shebang to awaken the Christ I am so that the mind, through the great form of Christedness I am, can become a creator being. And thus the mind of God that I am has revealed itself within form. Okay. Everybody, you get that? Hello? (laughs) Hello? Hello? Anyone there? Okay. What are the names? You mentioned when we talk about archangels, Mm -hmm. like Archangel Michael. Right. You mentioned that there are, or source mentions, there are other names of Archangel Michael that can be seen in ancient writing. What are those names? I'm not really quite sure what they are. I just know that Archangel Michael, we we think it as um, an angel with wings and, of course, the whole artistic creation, but it's really geometry. 
It is some of the original geometry from out of the original of the void. Archangel Michael is really a geometrical structure. Yes. That's why when we look at the energy form of Metatron. Right. Okay. The Metatron, that the geometric form, the that's, Metatron. A tr- that's a more true representation of an archangel. Wow. And they are, they are beings that were some of the original emanation from source before source even thought about becoming physical form. They began to architect consciousness. Hmm. Dang. And so they are ancient, ancient, ancient. But you see, what we've done, we have taken that and we brought it down to the smallest of an archangel. It has a form. It has an image. It's just a way that we conceive it in the mind. But in fact, it's one of the original source derivative. And this goes for basically all archangels. Yes. Yes. Each of them has a particular function in creation. So my mind goes then, okay, We've got like the Metatron cube. We've got the archangel that is this geometric structure. Mm -hmm. And then I go, well, I just want to go down the line here, go down the list. And I want to see like cymatically, what are the structures of these beings before they were kind of proposed to be this face? (laughs) Do we know what those are? No, it's uh, too exalted of a consciousness for us even to probably even imagine this particular time. But wouldn't that be cool if we could see? It would be cool. (laughs) But that's that's where we came from. You see, that's where we came from. The archangel is really us. It's like your fingers and your toes are part of you. And so the being that is the archangel emanated outrageous numbers of vibrations from it. And we are probably on some train or some uh, wave of, you know, one of those archangels. Now, what do you, how do you explain? And I'm no exception. I feel Mm -hmm. like I've been saved a few times in my life by, I guess, an angel Mm -hmm. or a being, something that spoke in my ear and told me to go this way and say that way, or, you know, don't walk across the street or, got pulled back into a car when my head was dangling when I was like seven. And, right. and, and I felt a hand and it pulled mm-hmm. me back. And, you know, all those stories that you can pick up at Barnes and Noble, Saved by the Angels. Sure. sure. If they're not beings, or maybe they weren't angels. They are beings. They are beings. It's just that they don't have bodies like we think they have bodies. They're a field of consciousness that in that field of consciousness can move matter or materiality, and we give it a form. It's just like, uh, you know, when you leave this physical body and go into spirit, you still have a form. Mm -hmm. It's not a form that you recognize as really a human being, so to speak, but it still has a form. It has consciousness. It can still be what we call a guide. It can still take a part of itself as consciousness and even as a guide, give you information in your ear, Mm -hmm. understanding. It's all just consciousness at many, many different levels, you see. Yeah. I think of when my father died when I was 28, and the the only day that this church was available for his brother's son to get married was on the um, eve, it was on the anniversary, excuse me, the anniversary of his death one mm-hmm. year later. And they thought, maybe we shouldn't do it. It's a little grim. I'm like, yeah, it was perfect. Right. So the that in the middle of the night i was sleeping in in the house where we were staying at at the my my uncle's house uh the night before his son was going to get married and i heard a coin drop on the floor and it just kind of went around and around and around like (laughs) sounded like a symbol and then it just went crash to the floor it was like a nickel Drop to the floor. I wake up. My mom is passed out on the other side of the room. And I have my hand on my heart and I wake up from a dead sleep. Hear this symbol that's a coin spinning around, goes flat. And above my bed, there is a massive ball of blue effervescent light. No body, no face. But I know it's my dad. 
It's just that knowing that perhaps in our beingness of the loving, I go, that's my dad. And he just said, basically, heart to heart, telepathically, I love you. And it was just beautiful. And it was simple and sweet. And then I went back to bed. And uh, I just go, oh, that's my dad. He's now this coming. He's not going to show up in his glasses and his tie. But he's going to show up in this beautiful, scintillating ball of blue, like a blue, massive blue orb. Yeah. And uh, And you see that that blue, that's what the field of the divine mind is. It's an electric blue field of mind. And so it could then take a piece of itself. Did you did you remember the movie? Um, but anyway, the the, the water um, the water was able to move itself into form. Uh. But anyway, so that's what the the divine mind can do. It can take a piece of itself and then create almost like a tubular part of itself, and then create a smaller smaller ball of energy within the room you're in. But it's really connected to this great great being of mine. That is your father at all the different levels of his being. He just happened to show up as this ball of blue light within the room. Mm. The mind of the great being he is, you see. Oh. It was individuated as your father. Gosh, that's so <laughs> just beautiful. <laughs> Striking. Abyss. Yeah. The movie Abyss. Yes. You yes. remember water. Yes. Water had consciousness and it could yes. then form itself and do things with it. Yes. That's exactly what your father did. Yes. With his, with his consciousness. I was first thinking cocoon. I was like, no, that's not that's not right. And then you're right, it was the abyss. I remember abyss. That. So how do people connect with angels more directly or this energy? Now, maybe you've said it a million times here today, but how do people, if people go, okay, there are these crystalline, there are these structures, there are this information of the mm-hmm. loving, of creation. We are part of it. It is us. Is how do, we, how do we get in touch with that? Well, first off, it's already within the fullness of the great being you already are. Your higher self already is perfected. And as you simply learn how to turn back inside and quiet the mind and begin to ask from inside out, you begin to create an open doorway into that intelligence that you already are. Mm. If you want to believe that it's angels, you simply say, dear angel, thank you for bringing information to me. And probably some information will come to you, but it could probably just be coming from your own divine mind that you gave permission to the angel to say that it's the mind over here. Ah. it's all source consciousness. There's only consciousness and you can delineate it of this is an angel and this is a higher self, but it's just consciousness. So and you have access to all of it. Yeah. I hear that. And I love that. What to you uh-huh. is heaven. Heaven is living joy and peace and harmony and love and grace on earth and sharing it with everything, every moment. Plant, animal, rock, stone. There's an amazing book called Haunt Yo, which is about the Lakota Sioux Indians. And they so revered the stone people, the tree people, you know, the water people, uh, the breath of life in all creation. When you read it, you're just back in this place of being in oneness with Mother Earth as great spiritual knowing. Mm. Lakota Sioux Indians. I love that. Okay, thank you. Well, to just kind of tie this all up, if we can, your your information, at least to me, and hopefully those listening, I think brings a tremendous uh, surge of hope to people knowing that good things are coming not because they're just coming with us sitting on the sofa and like eating chips but because it's us waking up to our own innate divine creation yes and it's like you can't stop this train so you want to get on this ride you're Mm -hmm. it's here for the taking 
Right. So it's very hopeful what you share and very encouraging. And yes, again, very exciting. Is there anything that you can leave for those, especially during this time of great transformation and for some perceivable loss for people that have feel they have lost a lot, right. experienced a lot of suffering, feel lost in their lives and themselves stuck mm -hmm. on any in any on any uh level what do you say to those that go this is all great but how do i get out of where i don't want to be anymore what do i do the bottom line is to learn to feel the emotion within you that's causing the chaos and if you're willing to feel the emotion without judgment or criticism, you observe it, but you then allow yourself to feel yourself going beneath it and find that childlike part of you that is feeling alone or separate or unloved, and you open your own heart. And everyone at some level knows the feeling of love. I remember when I was awakening this childlike part of me, and I had to learn to love this inner child. And I thought, well... It's not mom, and it's not dad, and it's not grandmother. What do I love? And I thought to myself, you know, my golden retriever dog. I love my dog. And so I would get the feeling of love for my golden retriever, and I would drop it down on top of this little boy, and I learned to love myself by loving my golden retriever dog. Mm. And day by day, more and more, the feeling of love awakened, and then I began to feel that it was really my higher self. It already was the fullness of love now giving me permission to begin to love myself. As I began to use that love to feel every emotion within me and go beneath it and love the child in the moment of feeling joy and peace and happiness, that began to be my creation. And when I forgot about him and once again began to feel lonely or sad, then loneliness and sadness showed up in my life. And I was smart enough to realize, oh, I'm creating that. I forgot myself. Mm -hmm. I forgot how to go inside and love the being that I am. And so I wasn't looking for something. I was simply revealing that which I already am inside. Because each of us as a child is born as a pristine jewel. The soul is a jewel. It takes a small facet of itself. It drops it down into time and space as a pure jewel. Mother and father form covered over with ignorance, but the jewel is still perfect. And it is the soul in its perfection, the divine mother, father, that created that part of us within form. If we're then allowing the love we are to go through the darkness and love the child, we automatically reveal the greatness of our own being. And then life begins to change dramatically around us. If we're not loving the self, we're going to continue to meet things out there that are challenging, we're going to be blaming, we're going to be criticizing, but it's just the self-criticism within is creating the criticism out. Right. I feel like the operative word here is permission, opposed to restriction. There's been so much restriction in our just human doingness. We've restricted ourselves collectively, individually, and now I feel the opportunity is really one of permission. And I feel like you're talking um, about that and sharing this great opportunity to permit that which you are to come forward into full right. expression. And the interesting thing, you see, all the chaos is driving that to us. Yes. The more you feel chaos and suffering, the more you want to find a solution. Right. So it's all part of the plan. It's not in error. And as more chaos and suffering is taking place, people are asking what and how and why. And so it's driving you to wake up. If you don't want to wake up, then the chaos is going to take you someplace else. Mm. Thus, the great divine order in chaos. Yes. Mm. It has a purpose. Well, Gary, I have to say, I've done about 50 of these on the Spiritual Geek Out podcast. And this might be my favorite. Thank you. Everybody, you need to pick up the source dialogues, the miracle mechanism of manifestation. And if you don't, well, you're just missing out. 
And of course, I'm always uh, open to assisting anyone. You know, if anyone wants to call, email, I'm, I'm here with nothing but to serve.